And my, the next presentation is mine. Brett, can you chair that part? Oh, it would be my privilege. So uh, next, um, I would like to introduce um, the next speaker, which is uh, Habu Sensei, Junko Habu. And the title of her presentation is Food Diversity and Traditional Subsistence Practice in Mountainous and Hilly Areas of Japan, Continuity and Change from the Jomon Period to the Present. She is also the organizer of this great symposium. So it is my pleasure to introduce Habu Sensei. Thank you, Brett. Okay, so, oh. okay, can you see my shared screen? Okay, so thank you. Um, my presentation today is about archaeology, ethnography, and agroecology. And I'm very interested in the continuity and change from the Jomon period, the prehistoric um, period in Japan, to the present. And initially, I was interested in the discussion of landscapes, ecosystems, environmental knowledge, material culture, and uh, mm, landscape as persistent places and temp uh, with different temporal and spatial scales. I'm also very interested in systems resilience, and I'd like to think about uh, long-term sustainability through case studies um, coming from um, prehistoric and historic period of Japan and beyond. So with that um, in mind, we had a large transdisciplinary project in Kyoto from 2014 to 17 called Long-Term Sustainability um, Through Place-Based Small-Scale Economies, Approaches from Historical Ecology. And this project started with uh, an assumption um, with, um, with, by questioning the assumption that large-scale production is more efficient and homogenized production is more efficient. We wanted to question these two basic uh, assumptions that people tend to make in the contemporary world. So I was very interested in the issue of diversity. What would happen if we lose food and subsistence diversity? We know that today, that monoculture is creating a lot of problems in different parts of the world. And uh, we do know that um, um, monoculture and too much specialization could put us into a big trouble. And my big question was, do we have something similar even during the Jomon period going back to several thousand years ago? So hypothesis was that highly specialized subsistence strategies, in other words, low food and subsistence diversity can support a larger population for a short period. However, a decrease in food and subsistence diversity makes society more vulnerable in the long run. And we used historical ecology as a theoretical framework with an emphasis on human impacts on the environment as, op as opposed to adaptation to the environment. We're very interested in historically unique trajectories of human sociopolitical system parts of the world. And we are very interested in processes operating at different temporal scales and also spatial scales. Um, in terms of temporal scale from short-term events to long-term changes, in terms of spatial scale um, and small villages to larger landscapes. And we're also very interested in what can we learn from there. So an emphasis on applied aspects. So as I said, we had three groups, the long degree groups with a focus on archeology span and paleoclimatology, um, contemporary society group with ethnography of rural communities in Japan and other parts of the world, and implementation, outreach and policy proposal group to apply what we learned from our um, <clears throat> archaeological and uh, ethnographic and the historical studies to think about contemporary and future issues. So in terms of my archaeology, I was very interested in the case study of the Sanai Maruyama site in Aomori prefecture that the Jomon, the big conundrum of Jomon is that um, when we look at the Jomon mm, site distribution data, it seems like the height of the population was during the middle Jomon period about uh, 5,300 years ago to 4,300 years ago. And then the number of sites, the size, average size of sites um, decreases. So 
So it looks like that the population decreased. And uh, on the Sanai Maruyama site, which is the largest Jomon period settlement, which was supposed to be in a baseball stadium, and you can see the baseball stadium construction started to take place, eventually it turned out to be such an important site that now um, it's a national historic site and it's now preserved. But anyway, this site, um, the occupation ended right around the end of the Middle Jomon period. So to look at the growth and decline of the um, life history of this site um, can tell us some ideas of what was happening in this period. So looking at our Sanai Maruyama data, what I noticed was that if we look at stone tool assemblages as a reflection of subsistence diversity, when you think of your kitchen, if you have lots of different types of tools, then that means you're cooking many different kinds of food. If you have a very limited number of tools, you might still be cooking a fair amount of different things, but um, generally speaking, the number of um, your tool um, diversity reflects your food and subsistence diversity. That was my hypothesis. And looking at that, we see a decrease in diversity in stone tool types in the middle of the middle Jomon period, but um, and that coincided with an increase in the number of pit dwellings. And in the middle of the Middle Jomon period, um, we see that um, more focus on plant food processing tools um, really looks like the ha first half of the Middle Jomon. People are heavily relying on the certain types of plant foods, probably um, nuts, possibly chestnuts or um, other types of nuts. And then that subsistence practice ended up abruptly around the middle of the Jomon period. And shortly after that, we see a big population decline reflected in the number of pit dwellings. And then um, eventually the site was abandoned. So in the past, many Japanese archaeologists explained this as the result of cooling climate that hit uh, Japan, right around at the end of the Middle Jomon period. But what I'm finding is that the population decrease started several hundred years before the cooling climate hit Japan. And that seems to be right after the change in the subsistence practice. So uh, my interpretation of the data is that people are intensifying their subsistence practice towards more emphasis on nuts and then they did intensification too much to the point that they made their subsistence practice um, less um, sustainable and resilient. And that led to a population decline. And after that, the cooling climate hit Japan. And uh, in our Kyoto project, we were able to get more radiocarbon dating to nail down the sequence and uh, the results are consistent with our hypothesis. So with Sanai Moriyama, one of the things that is very interesting is that Japanese scholars were suggesting that um, during the Middle Jomon period, Sanai Moriyama residents were actually um, maintaining chestnut orchard. Now, this is um, looking at the Sanai Moriyama data, it's a complex site. So obviously, um, you see a lot of changes through time, but this is a schematic. Uh, spatial distribution of space use are proposed by Professor Tsuji of the University of Tokyo. And here he's showing that the village here, laka trees were maintained um, near the village, chestnut orchard was surrounding the village and secondary vegetation was there. And then this is this forest and um, primary forest was surrounding the site. Now, when you think of this, if you have a chestnut orchard like this to maintain a chestnut, um, orchard like this, what does that mean? To simplify the diversity of vegetation, um, would that be possible to maintain it for a long time? Um, these are all the big questions that we need to think about. But what I want to say is that number one, I think a shift to starchy food, um, starchy food becoming staple food, that was probably more important than a shift from hunting gathering life ways to um, agricultural systems. That um, when that kind of shift with a focus on starchy food occurs, there are so many um, implications related to that. 
And if you do it in the wrong way, then you could put yourself into a big trouble. Now, I don't have a firm evidence that that actually put Jomon people into a huge trouble, but that's one of the possibilities that we are thinking. Um, so change in the food system from the generalist to specialists. Um, hunter gatherers with really diverse uh, range of food to hunting gathering, uh, managing the environment, but with a heavy reliance on starchy food, acorns, buckeyes, chestnuts, and possibly warabi bracken, and lily tuber, and even millet. Um, that um, seemed to have occurred during and after the early Jomon period. And what happened during this period and how that um, can that be tied to the environmental management practice? Uh, these are the big questions that we are asking. And with that question in mind, uh, we collaborated very closely with the second group of our Kyoto project um, who are conducting various types of ethnographic research. And what we learned was that in the mountainous part of Japan, there are still um, many traditional practices that we can see with an emphasis on diversity of food and subsistence activities. And they do still retain traditional ecological knowledge. The forms may be different. People may be using new technologies, but we definitely see continuity in the ideas of maintaining diversity and maintaining many backup plants. This slide shows an example of our field work in the upper Hay River Valley in Northern Iwate Prefecture in the middle of the um, Kitakami Mountains. Some more slides from the same areas. Um, this slide shows a warabi bracken field and that uh, this is warabi, processing warabi. So the main results of our ethnographic work at the Hay River Valley is that really um, you can see that food and subsistence diversity supported by traditional ecological knowledge plays a critical role in the resilience of food systems and communities. And the local networks are also very important. Of course, efforts to revitalize the areas through farmers markets and local products are there and it has varied success um, rates. Some are doing very well, others are having a big problem. Depopulation is a serious problem today and large scale land development plans with anticipated serious environmental damage threaten small scale food production producers. But um, we see that there are a lot of um, efforts that are trying to maintain um, these um, efforts. And uh, as part of our project, one of the highlights of our project was a basket making workshop at the Ainu Museum in Shiraoi, where we invited an elder um, from the Suquamish uh, tribe. And what he said was that um, he was giving a basket weaving uh, <clears throat> workshop, but he said that 80% of his work goes into obtaining raw materials. And it starts with planting trees in the forest. So really maintaining forests um, is really an important part when we think about uh, the resilience of the system. So these are the three key theoretical issues that emerged out of a small scale economies project. And when we think of Japan, you can see that Japan is a very mountainous country. When you tend to think Tokyo and Osaka as big cities as representative of Japan, but you can see it's only a tiny portion of Tokyo here and Osaka here. Two thirds of the country is covered with forest. And with that in mind, we are looking at the ethnographic data and archeological data from um, three areas that we focused in our small scale economies project, Upper Hay River Valley, the Joboji in Iwate, and the Fukushima city, and uh, several other locations within Fukushima prefecture. We are also looking at the um, published environmental assessment data coming from Nibutani in Hokkaido, where uh, we do have uh, a lot of information from indigenous Ainu people. We haven't done any ethnographic work there, but we are reading a lot and we are communicating with people um, in Nibutani. And with this in mind, you can see that um, these are um, 400 meter to 200 meter above sea level. Um, even in a lower area like Hiyoshi and Tsurumi River Valley in Yokohama City, which is much lower in terms of above sea level um, elevation, 
in fact, this is still a hilly area that when you think of people's life rates, it's not the rice paddy field is only a small portion. You can really see that um, importance of uh, non-rice paddy field culture. I just showed the slides, Upper Hay River Valley, um, the paddy vegetation tied to slash and burn agriculture, joboji um, with lacquer um, sap collecting as part of their subsistence cycle, um, which is very close to an important archaeological site of Goshono. And in Fukushima, our initial assumption was that damage by the Fukushima nuclear accident may have been too large to test the importance of food diversity, traditional ecological knowledge, and social networks. But in the uh, low contamination area, what we are finding is actually these are the critical part of people's identity and the people's effort to uh, maintain their efforts to find a way to continue environmental management. And uh, in Nibutani, in Hokkaido, we are looking at a published environmental assessment data. And finally, the Tsurumi River Valley, you can see that this is very close to the ocean, but you can still see that it's a very hilly area with a little bit of rice paddy fields here and there. This is today, um, this is where I grew up actually, but I can still visualize the landscape when I was a kid and how things were. And you can see the traces of the landscape practice in the past. So um, in conclusion, I would like to emphasize that archaeological sites are as part of the cultural landscape and examining continuity and change in landscape practice will help us understand the resilience of food and socioeconomic systems in the past, present, and future. And uh, um, the issue of staple food in Japan, um, people tend to think Japan as an emphasis on rice paddy um, field practice, but you see a lot of um, different lines of evidence with an emphasis on different types of subsistence practices. And uh, we see that um, possible importance of cultural fire, you can see from Komei-san presentation um, and Ikea-san presentation, that it was there until the 1950s. And uh, um, how do we think about the environmental implication? That is a big question that we need to think about. And I believe that um, collaboration between archaeology, agroecology, and ethnography is very important. More collaboration with local stakeholders are needed and that training the next generation of scholars in um, transitional and uh, um, a trans, um, transnational and transdisciplinary context is important. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um, I think I use up all the 20 minutes, so we have to move on to the next presentation.